Welcome to Stan Speak Shine, episode 221. In today's episode, we have a truly inspiring guest, Danielle Matthews, and I'll introduce her bio as she and I commence our discussion. We're really diving into consciousness, spirituality, the profound lessons we can learn from really life-altering accidents or illnesses, or I would even say major life shifts or transitions that you're actually experiencing in the physical body, especially. We're going to discuss how important it is to embrace duality the light and darkness within ourselves, which you guys hear me talk about a lot, but also finding that same balance in our relationships because our relationships are our greatest teachers and then practicing true presence. When you're kind of in a swirl, all you can do is like sometimes close your eyes and just be with whatever is happening in the midst of that adversity and what can ensue with post-traumatic growth syndrome when you emerge post-transformation as a different person and how you might be perceived by others and experience yourself. Next episode, 222, you know, guys all know how much I love twos. I actually launched this podcast on February 2nd at 2.22 a.m. But anyway, 222 is a pattern for me, but I'm announcing something really special on episode 222. And my guest is someone I've been following for a very long time. And we get very, very transparent and real about um, some powerful experiences that we've had a parallel journey with. So stay tuned for that episode 222 airing on October 25th. For now, get ready to be inspired by our guest, Danielle Matthews, as we dive into navigating the unknown. So I've got Danielle Matthews today with me. I'm Stan Speak Shine. Welcome, Danielle. Hey, thanks for having me, Sherry. So I'm just going to read your bio for our listeners so we kind of get some context around your background. At the age of 23, Danielle was hit by a drunk driver and sustained a life-altering injury to her brain. The medical world said there was no hope of recovery and told her to accept this life as her quote, new normal. Although her body was physically impaired, her spirit was strong and she refused to believe their diagnosis. Her mind was determined to recover and she did. She's a testament to the concept of post-traumatic growth, which we're gonna explore that topic, and has since built an international business leading an organization that did 2.2 million in sales last year, authored an ebook called Mind Control, It's All in Your Head, and shares her life-altering experience with countless people around the globe. So again, welcome. And you and I connected on a more personal note, and I'm sure my sister Tanya won't mind because she's such an open book, but my sister Tanya actually sustained a traumatic brain injury last year. And she's in, I guess you could say, that post-traumatic growth phase Mm -hmm. and learning lots of lessons, as is my dear friend Caroline and um hers was about a year and a half ago. So this is close to me, a dear friend, my close sister. And um, so I've kind of followed their journeys closely and have so much compassion on quote unquote, the universe hitting you over the head, which I can share from with both of us, my friend and my sister, they both feel that way. Yeah. So let's start there. Um, Let's start there because I know you dive deep into consciousness and spirituality and all of that. And I know that you are um, aligned with me in the, I guess you could say belief, even though it's not unequivocally across the board, that oftentimes when we get in some kind of a life altering accident or have an illness or something, there's, there's a deep, deep lesson there. There's something the universe wants to teach us. So maybe let's start there and any context you want to give around your own experience with that. Absolutely. I think every challenge is making something possible. And when you have that lens, I think you get through your challenges faster. (laughs) Um, You know, I have found in life, some people it's with relationships, like somehow we keep pulling in the same dynamics, you know, it's a different person, different name, different, all these things, but somehow like you keep finding yourself like, in a situation where your worth is not being seen or um, you're being abandoned or, you know, your voice isn't heard. And I find that life uh, is, that's what it's unfolding to show you. It's unfolding to show you what's within you that hasn't been addressed and that is actually weighing you down in some way. And it's like preventing you from being the fullest expression of yourself. Uh, There's a teaching that I love and I'll, I'll dive right into it. It's, it's kind of, (laughs) yeah, we're going to go there now. Uh, Drink my tea while you (laughs) talk. Yeah. So one of my, one of my teachers said one time, Danielle, look at life. Um, think about a garden. 
And in a garden, right, there's always seeds under the ground and they're just sitting there dormant until the white, the right weather pattern comes in. And when you get the right amount of rain and sunshine and, you know, the soil, the nutrients are there, it sprouts and it grows. And then it comes to the surface where it can be seen. And what this, you know, philosophy says is life the people around you, the circumstances, my accident, the things that your loved ones have been involved with were the right weather patterns for these seeds that are within us to all of a sudden be exposed. And the, the yogis say that even groups of souls will choose to travel together lifetime to lifetime to create the weather patterns for one another to uh, reveal yes, inside no. of them. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, like I just had like a little visceral response in my body, but it's good. No, I believe it. Keep going. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, I know sometimes it strikes these chords and you're like, Oh, that's too real. But it's like, it's to me, this way that's a deep teaching and to say, okay, so these souls are in my world, uh, to reveal to me something I can't see myself. Like we don't know the seed is there until the weather makes it sprout and so much of so many of us like so many times in life we blame the situation or the person and we say well like for me my car accident i forever was like this isn't fair i didn't deserve this this shouldn't have happened to me you know i had all these feelings of victimhood uh baked into my being and the accident was a beautiful chance for me to realize like that doesn't serve me. That philosophy doesn't serve me. That way of interacting with the world doesn't serve me. Like it came, it's here, you know, whether it was something I deserved or not, it doesn't matter. Like I have to realize that my happiness isn't dictated by the external world. My happiness can be an internal decision. You know, I have control over my inner world, not my outer world. Like these were the lessons I had to learn because there were seeds within me. For me, it was like this victim, you know, mentality that just, it does not serve you in life. It cannot serve you uh, to grow a business for sure. And it will create relationship dynamics that are not good. Uh, So that was an, an example of a lesson for me. And I think you know, how many times do we feel like our loved ones trigger us the most (laughs) when we're like, you know, and we so quickly blame them. Don't push that button. Don't go there. You know what that does to me. Why are you doing this? And the reality is like, it's you that is the problem. You're the one being triggered and you're the one that has this, we'll call it a weed, right? That's getting sprouted up inside of you and it's uncomfortable and you're blaming them because it wasn't there until they came and did this thing. But the truth is that thing's inside of you and what an opportunity, like the trigger is the teacher. And so express gratitude to that soul, that situation for showing you like, oof, there's something unresolved here that you need to address because otherwise it's like that. See, to me, I, I look at it as this like block of energy, you know, that's just like holding you down in some way. And you don't even know what's there. You know, sometimes people are like, you know, I just, I like, I self-sabotage, like my life is just not unfolding the way that I know it could be or should be. And I don't know what it is, but it's like, well, what are you getting triggered by? That's a a clue (laughs) that the world is giving you as to the thing inside of you that's holding you back. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, um, you know, what's coming to my mind too is, and people, I don't know, this is just a, like, a phrase that people throw out, like, what about starving kids in Africa? Like, what did they do to create that? Or what about Mm. children who become abused or neglected or whatever? And I read this book probably, gosh, 20 ish years ago by Carolyn. uh, I want to say it's Carolyn Mice, sacred contracts. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to what you're saying. And I've heard other teachers teach it in a myriad of different ways over the years, but it's essentially like, we form these contracts or um, like you're saying with soul groups or families or, you know, to create these weather conditions and say, okay, I'm going to come cloaked this way to teach you, but we're just having like a pre earth conversation with souls. Like however that works, I don't know, but like I'll come down, I'll trigger this in you because you have a karmic wound here or you have some lesson here that I can help bring out. So you don't keep repeating this over and over and over again. Um, And it's so interesting because I have a couple of really marked experiences in my life where I know this to be true in my very cells, bones, tissues, blood, everything down to the DNA, spiritual DNA level that um, 
at least two, three actually people come to mind who, who have triggered me in ways that hits my heartstrings so deeply that there was no other person or situation that could have mm. brought that out. Yes. And so, and, and, you know, one of them is one of my child's birth mothers. Um, mm. And I'll just say it's my daughter, Emma's birth mother. And it's a long story and very spiritual story. Actually, she's my youngest daughter. But her, the events around her birth were so precarious. The situation was so dangerous. And like she ended up saying she was going to place Emma with us. And then I went and bonded with her at birth and she changed her mind. And, and it was really dark. And then three weeks later, CPS, Child Protective Services, came and took her out of the home mm. and six court hearings later. Anyway that birth mother Madison and I'm sure she's great with me yeah. sharing this because it's also going in my book and we've had open conversations about this she's done a lot of healing and has had other children and gotten married since then but it was a very very dangerous situation and I pulled out all my life coaching skills all my parenting I already had five kids like I was pulling it all out and nothing worked except mm -hmm. surrender and love yes love I just had to unconditionally love her because she never had been this yeah. birth mother. And now um, it's really beautiful. And Emma's nine. And anyway, I, that's just one situation that I'm like, I know Madison is a bright, beautiful soul, but who came to decided to come down and have her own lessons. She was in foster care herself. Her birth mother served time in prison. She had a very abusive upbringing. And here at 19, she has my daughter. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a very, very precarious moment by moment situation. And in order for her to not reunify, because the courts want the, the birth mother to reunify with the child that's in foster care, mm -hmm. um, in order for her to not reunify, she had to stand up in court on the sixth court hearing and say, and put her attorney away and say, I want the Burtons to adopt my baby. Like it shocked everyone in the courtroom. It was high courtroom drama. We were there, we were crying anyway. So, you know, certain souls will come cloaked in different forms that we may see as dysfunctional. We may see as wrong. Let's just say that the lessons they teach those of us who are quote unquote in the right, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> are profound yeah. absolutely profound so with that climate analogy you just used with the soil conditions and seed and the weather um one of the other quotes i really love is that we are the waters our children are swimming in mm. and we were we're actually the waters that anyone is swimming in that we're with yep so when you're talking about victim consciousness Let's dive a little deeper into that um, because that's also been up for me a lot. Like, how do you know, what have you experienced with that? I know you work with people and I know that you yourself have, it sounds like you have had quite the journey out of that victim mentality. Um, what if someone truly is a victim? What if they are on the receiving end of something really horrific that they um, let's just say didn't attract. Cause I hate, that's what I hate about the law of attraction. You attracted that or da, 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 you know, um, <laughs> and it might be true, but I'm just thinking of really horrific conditions where somebody is truly a victim. Mm -hmm. Let's just say of, um, sexual violence. How, mm -hmm. how do you frame that with not going into a state of, like unequivocally across the board, like you chose that or don't be a victim? Right. I mean, it's intense. You think like domestic abuse, you think of sexual assault, like all of these things. It's, you know, no one is saying, I'm not condoning those things. I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying anyone deserves to have those things. But um, sometimes the darkness is what allows you to appreciate the light, if that would make sense. And I think a lot of times I have this behind me, this yin yang, and I have one here on my desk because I think you know, everything, the totality of it all is what you said before, love. Like we are love, everything is love. And when we come into this earth plane and we're here in this 3D world, uh, polarity exists because in order to appreciate 
the light, you must know what darkness is. In order to enjoy love, you must also know what hate feels like. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as humans, we have this, uh, our mind jumps in and says, well, one is right and one is wrong. One is good and one is bad. One is okay to feel and the other is not okay to feel. And I think that creates duality and it creates situations where um, we're in conflict with what is. And it's not to say one is better than the other. It's to say, well, this is here. What could it be revealing to me? You know, what is it showing me? Uh, what is it teaching me? Maybe it's teaching me how to have unconditional love mm -hmm. for everyone because other spirits are so confused as to who they are and the truth of it all. Um, that's deep and that's hard. Uh, maybe it's to figure out, you know, your own self-worth. You're going through the dark, 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 because you're not believing that you're worthy of anything better. And, and sometimes it's like life will give you lesson after lesson, opportunity after opportunity. And after you don't get the lesson, it gets louder and louder until it's so big. You can't ignore it. Like it breaks you. And <laughs> I've got so many things on my desk, but like this, so I yeah, think everyone about, that's watching on YouTube is getting some cool visuals. She has this yin yang thing that she pulled apart. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so for those that, that are listening now, I've got this like black rock in my hand. And I think sometimes, um, uh, we like getting broken feels so intense and we resist it because it doesn't feel good. Right. That's the, the duality part. But sometimes when you break, it breaks open to something beautiful. Oh, geode. And, what is that? It's purple. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a pink, beautiful geode. Um, and like, I put that on my desk because sometimes you know, you, you question life. You're like, why, why does it have to be so difficult? Why would things happen like that? And I have such a strong faith that every soul is going through its own. I think of it almost like a jungle gym, this lifetime. It's like its own learning journey because of things that it wanted to seek to understand and experience, right? The, the yogic philosophy says, look, when you're at oneness, when we're just this, when we're the ocean, we can't experience that we have to come into expression we have to come into physical form we have to come into this body to experience the world and when we do that we have to have polarity because we have yeah. to be able to experience the dark to know the light right it, it is necessary but we get so confused as humans because we have the ability to think like animals you know i watch my dog and my cat all the time when something intense happens tra traumatic you will see they'll shake after and it's like they shake the energy away mm. you know uh people we don't like to feel it and we kind of push it down and we don't we don't let it go and it starts to build up in us and it becomes pr uh, problematic and we start to go i don't want to go there you know that doesn't feel good whereas if we had just released the thing if we had let it pass through without all the emotional attachment and whatever chatter about it we'd be better off like an animal uh they're still connected, you know, to that divine intuition. Um, people are not, but that's the whole point, I believe, of the human journey is to come back from the duality, from what the mind is saying is good or bad, from our own experiences, and to say, okay, like, it all can just be, and I'm going to be the loving, receptive thing to all of it, not judging anything because I don't understand. Not saying I condone it, not saying it's okay, but when things unfold, I stop and I go, all right, well, why is that move being made on my chessboard? Like, what could it be within me that maybe is unfinished? Or how is this uh, pointing to something else? I think, you know, I, I, again, I'm not saying anyone deserves to be abused or assaulted or anything like that. No one deserves that. But if you look from a higher perspective on the soul level, knowing that, okay, I came into this life to understand and learn something very deep, if you want to learn how to unconditionally love, you were going like yourself to have to face some really heavy things that your mind is going to scream at you. Like, no, <laughs> I can't love the everything, but like, there's the yeah. line. And wherever that line is, is the thing you're going to butt up against because unconditional love allows for it all. Yeah. That's beautiful. And I love the visual of just merging that duality, the yin, the yang, the dark, the light, if you will. And 
not making the dark wrong. And I think that's what you're saying. You know, we have all this conditioning around good, bad, right, wrong. And so there's a lot of self-judgment that ensues and we're afraid to sit in the dark. And yes. the dark, we're not saying like evil, bad, horrible stuff. We're just saying like we all have shadows. Yeah. And that's a lot of the dark feminine that comes out in this podcast. We have guests that talk a lot about the dark feminine or being in the cave or gestating in the cosmic womb and those kinds of things because it is dark. And it, all it means is you can't see you can't see the growth that's happening. That's, I love that visual behind you with the, the part of the gang that is a dark that has a tree growing with her roots and it's sprouting up into the light. Yeah. Nature teaches us all these things. I um, hadn't thought about that with dogs or animals and how they shake it off. But that, yeah. And they're not afraid to howl either. And they're not afraid to get out in the moment, whatever is happening and, and arising yeah. for them to what's dark, yeah. whatever dark light. So Let's move forward to relationships because I know that's something that you've been um, kind of diving into re recently and looking at relationships from a higher perspective and mm -hmm. being conscious. Conscious relationships are a, a real fascination of mine. Um, I have three brothers, three sisters, three sons, three daughters. Like I have lots of business associations and I've just in this lifetime, I've just surrounded myself, I've like collected people and surrounded myself with lots of communities. So it's really been a fascination of mine to look at con like relationships from a higher perspective. Mm -hmm. So what can you share as share some wisdom around that with us? Yeah, I think, I think that, well, first of all, I say relationships create a lot of uh, therapeutic irritation <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of like triggering and counter triggering that can go on uh, because they're around you all the time, right? Your closest people, whether it's business relationships or your, you know, your family, your closest friends, your, your children and embrace that. It's, it's learning to set the context of, and, you know, not in the moment saying like, this is your, like for the example we used before, this is your weed that's popping up and this is your problem. And don't you put this on me? Like, that's not going to be helpful in the moment. But if in the moment you can love them because you see like, oh man, this is not about me. <laughs> I, I am a character in a movie right now. And I just triggered something about their desire to never be controlled. And I said something from a space that like, oh, I don't know, from an outside observer would have felt like nothing but they've taken it as like, you can't control me. You can't tell me what to do. And like, that has nothing to do about the situation. You know, it's not about taking the laundry out of the dryer, but like, it's about something deeper. And so in that moment, I think, what do you do with darkness? You shine light and it doesn't fight with it. It just dissolves it. And I think those are the moments where you just give love and you just, you do not allow yourself to be moved into some trigger of your own. You can observe your reaction and you can work with that later because that's yours to deal with. Um, but just send love in the moment and just be able to be centered and calm and say like, you know, I love you and whatever you need right now, like just totally back down from wherever you were because we get into our heads. We like to kind of get in this tit for tat. Nobody wins. I think a conscious relationship is realizing that you were there to support your partner in seeing the things they can't see within themselves so that they have the space, a beautiful loving space to work through it and to be received and to know that it's okay that that's in there. You don't have to hide it because only then it's going to pop out at times that are really inconvenient. Uh, let's work with it when it shows up. And, you know, I think sometimes we, uh, I mean, I did this for a long time. I would get into relationships where I felt like the other person um, finished me. Is, if that makes sense. I don't know if that word is right, but it's you like, complete right? Me yeah, right. I needed them to feel complete and whole. Yeah. And then when it, when they weren't doing the things I wanted in the way that I desired, you know, the way that would make me feel good and loved and all those things, I would get upset. I wasn't loving them or allowing them to be who they were. It was like, I had this expectation of like, well, you need to make me feel good. And you used to, and now you're not, and this is a problem. Uh, and, and the reality is that I've learned is, you know, that good feeling has to come from within. Like you have to be whole and complete on your own. And I think a good conscious relationship is that where you love the other because together you're amplified because together you've agreed to help hold space and like help one another grow. Um, but there is no, like the codependency isn't there. You know, and I think that's where a lot of dynamics get crazy because we expect the other person to do our work for us, but it's our work 
our inner work is what I'm talking about. And sometimes you can get so enmeshed and make, if you, especially very more on the empathic side where you absorb their trauma, mm-hmm. let's just say, or their un- unresolved, you know, healing issues. Um, I, I hear what, what you're saying is really resonating with me in the sense that like, it really is just about holding space. You know, if you have somebody in your ex- extrinsic world, your inter- external environment, who's triggering something in you, it's always an invitation. Usually we want to just hurry. And it's so like it, the, the trigger is so painful that we just want to deflect it and project it out and make it about them. So really it's just holding space for what is triggering then triggered within you and love yourself. Like, I think it was Eckhart Tolle uh, who said, you know, something to, and I'm not going to get this verbatim, but it's something about when you wake up to the fact that relationships are here to make you conscious instead of happy, Uh that's when everything changes. Because all of our societal conditioning is around what you were saying, somebody doing, making you feel good, somebody completing you, somebody, you know, bringing out the best in you. But really, if it's a conscious relationship, they're bringing out the worst in you. (laughs) 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 and i say that like keep yourself safe keep you know take care of you don't stay in an abusive i'm not saying that don't stay in abusive but but if that person loves you and they're holding space for your soul evolution and conscious growth they're going to bring out some of the worst aspects of who you are that's why you're together that's why you attracted each other yeah and it's and it's it's so beautiful when it can happen but it's it's so difficult also because sometimes it's like we just want a a break from it it's like we use the relationship as an excuse to not have to like you know feel these parts of ourselves that we don't like and when you're in this like loving space uh at the beginning of every relationship right it's there and then the problems creep in because you know then you really get to know each other. The parts that have, you know, those little seeds that are under there (laughs) start to get triggered. And that's where the consciousness comes in. I love, I literally, I have uh, the power of now right here, Eckhart Tolle's book. Um, I've just, the first time I picked it up, I had a woman say to me, Danielle, if there was one book that you could read, like in your life, you were told you get one book for life. She said, that's the book. And I went, oh, that's now by Wayne Dyer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Quite an endorsement. I've got that book and I haven't, I haven't read it for a while. Uh, wow. What an impact he made in this world, like mm-hmm. insanely um, conscious and way ahead of his time and talking about things maybe that we weren't completely ready for. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but go ahead. What, what, what do you love about that? Like, like if you could distill it down to how it created a divine spark in you, especially as we're talking about post-traumatic growth syndrome. (laughs) Right. Yeah. How does that align with the power of now? Well, I think, oh my God, it all aligns. Like, okay, well, the power of now with with this book, what what it's talking about is basically to be able to be present and realize the moments where you're getting triggered or your mind is chatty about something that's pulling you into the ego. It's pulling you into what he calls psychological time where you're butting up the experience against your past and saying, well, I've in the past liked these things. So this is good in the past. This hasn't gone well. So I don't like it. And you're every time you do that, you're pulling yourself away from the magic of the now and experiencing like the fact that in the now, everything just is what it is and it's beautiful and it's divine. And it is, that is the all encompassing. It's like the sky that's there, no matter what the weather is, like it's just all embracing thing. But the moment you get pulled into the hurricane or the rain or the snow or the whatever's going on, like you miss the bliss of being able to just be the supportive backdrop of it all. And I think that to me, trauma, uh, going through really intense things like I did with my brain injury, like you're, 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 loved ones are on their journey of, I believe that it's what brought me closer to, it was like, I had to, I was in this hurricane, right? My life looked nothing like it did before. I, with the brain injury, I couldn't work. I couldn't hang out with friends. I was told I'd never be able to snowboard again, which was a huge part of my life. Um, everything that I thought I was, was taken. And so then it was like, well, what's left? And what was left for me was the present moment because I couldn't think about the future because I get severe anxiety and panic attacks. And I couldn't think about the past because it was like slipping away from me more and more this person that, you know, my mind had said I was all the things I had done in the external world and my achievements and accomplishments and whatever. When that was all gone, it was like, well, what's left? And what was left was the present moment. And I was so forced into it. It's like every spiritual practice tells you to go there. Um, 
I, by just sheer force of the environment I was in, had to go there. Like I couldn't plan 10 minutes later because I didn't know how I'd be feeling. And I found the beauty. It was like, this has been sitting in front of us always. And we've been so distracted by life and, you know, circumstances and trying to achieve and getting the relationship and getting the job and getting the right things for our kids and all the material things that it's blurred our vision to the reality of like what's really in front of us and how just, I mean, it's nothing, but it's blissful. Like when you can, when you actually see it, it's like you, first of all, you can't unsee it (laughs) and then it's with you always. And I'm, to me, post-traumatic growth is when someone is able to take a trauma that they've been through and use it as the catalyst, like I showed with that geode, as the thing that opened them up to something even more beautiful, that without it, without having been shattered, broken down to nothing, having to lose you know, everything the ego said you were, without that, it never could have happened. And it had to be so big and so intense that it shook you on the core level to go, oh my gosh, my soul came here for something else. There's more to this than just my mind and, you know, these material things. Like, as wonderful as they are, and we're here to enjoy them, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying renounce your life and, like, go meditate and don't do anything. No, like, have goals, go achieve out in the world, like, go produce, but do it from the space of just enjoying the moment to moment, not like my happiness comes when I get there and, you know, it all will be better when I achieve X. Cause the reality is no, you have no right to the result. You have the right to your actions to enjoy the process. And that's life. <laughs> and as the process is kicking up stuff inside of you, like that's why you're here. That's the work, you know, that's the beauty of it. It's like a playground. And I think post-traumatic growth, if you talk to people that have been through severe traumas, they'll tell you, like, I'm so grateful that happened because my perspective now on life is completely shifted forever. And it's changed every relationship, everything that I want to do, the way that I talk and interact with people. You'll find that they're more, um, there's a, I have found a peace inside of those people, an awareness, um, almost like a magnetism of like, well, they, they've touched on something that I think everyone is seeking. Um, and you know, they went through the darkness to, to find it. Yeah. The two, the two dear ones, Caroline and Tanya to me who have had these, and we're talking about a physical issue, but I know there are people who deal with this on multiple different issues, but we just happen to be narrowing in on something that literally stopped them. And and my friend Caroline has said that she was praying that before this happened, okay, I promise God, after this, I'll slow down. Like she was literally having those conversations with God in her head. And, um, my sister also was saying like, um, you know, just they're both busy bodies and they're both hugely influential people. They have, they're both coaches. They influence a lot of people. And, um, my sister Tanya and I have had really in-depth conversations and she's like, yep, this, this, this puts me, I am forced to be in the present moment. I I have to narrow in on the now because otherwise I just suffer. Like, yeah. like you were talking about the anxiety or just um like, Oh, right now I'm dizzy. I need to shut my eyes or right now this or that. And just the self, the moment by moment self care that has um, been kind of an outgrowth of this. Yeah. Um, okay. So what, what do you, as we kind of wrap this up, let's talk about practical ways that you have found are very impactful for people to be in the present. Let's just say, well, there's a couple of scenarios. Um, what if, what if, what would you say to a listener who feels like they're sitting in the dark right now? They just, Mm. maybe they're in a life transition or they're going through something really traumatic. For me, when I was going through something really traumatic, I call it like my dark night of soul period. Um, I was trying to minimize it. So I wasn't allowing myself to fully feel it. Um, so that would be my first suggestion um, is just if you are in the dark, like if you don't want to stay there any longer than is absolutely necessary, even though we are in charge of the timing, I learned that as well. We are not in charge of the timing, our higher self and our creator, however you define that they are the ones who are putting us into these learning uh, environments, <laughs> let's just say. But yeah, so so someone who's sitting in the dark and they just can't see the forest for the trees, they don't know how much longer they can endure, there's that person. And then there's just the person who just deals with everyday life stressors. Um, maybe they're not going through anything quote unquote major right now, but maybe they do have some unaddressed trauma and they're 
they're afraid to sit in the dark. They're afraid to go to those places um, or to sit in a conscious relationship and notice their triggers and those things. So how, how have you seen, or what are some best practices for putting an individual in the present moment and the dark? Yeah. Wow. So, so much there. Um, <laughs> all right. For, I will say one look for those that are in, in it right now. Uh, it's a gift. It's a gift from the divine. It has come in a really weird package. Um, uh, but it is the antidote is in the obstacle. And so you're going to have to move through it. It's the only way to get to the other side and it will be beautiful, but it's like, it's test day. Like this is where you are going to have to put to the test, everything that is within you that you have learned along the way. And you are also going to realize you have capabilities. You are, you are connected to things so far beyond you that are so much more powerful than you. And you're going to be forced to learn to find those. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And that's how you come out of it. And so the person you will be on the other side is going to be more resilient. It's going to be empowered. It's going to be the best version of you. And you go to the gym to work out and you don't mind picking up heavier weights when you go, because you know, the breakdown makes you stronger. Uh, I don't know why in life we think it should be any different, but the things and circumstances that we go through are breaking us down mentally, emotionally, spiritually, so that we rebuild stronger. And for those that are, you know, maybe life is good and you're like, I don't want to go into this stuff that they're talking about. Um, pay attention because if you don't listen, the lesson gets louder, louder, louder until like your friend, okay, I'll slow down soon. No, I'm going to force you to slow down. Now you're slow. Yeah. <laughs> now pay attention. Right. And it was the same thing in my life. I was always going, 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 going. And it, I was like, you know, top achiever, top of my class, everything. And then it was like, life said, stop. Like you need to stop. You need to slow down. You're pursuing things in this external world that are not actually the pursuit of why your soul came here. And, um, I'm so grateful, you know, and I think wow. express gratitude for the gift that's in front of you. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, yeah. And, and actually like, even my two loved ones, um, you know, they were, like I said, very influential before they had a lot of, I guess you would say leadership, uh, in the world and in their domains. But now that people see that we're are in their sphere of influence, who see what they're going through, the respect and the inspiration has magnified, uh -huh. not diminished. And I think that was the fear is if I can't show up this way, like I did before, I'm not going to be as influential. I'm not going to be as impactful. Um, and that was my fear when I was going through the dark night. It's like, I'm changing alchemically here. Yeah. The, the, the old version of Sheree, she's dying. And I'm afraid that the new version is not going to, you know, and I'm still in that butterfly soup in a lot of ways, <laughs> um, caterpillar soup, whatever. So I love that. Um, you know, sometimes we have to, when we're talking about merging duality, that is a choice moment by moment. It's not something that you just achieve and cross off. I did it. I, I merged my shadows, like, like till the, you you take your last dying breath, you know, it's a conscious choice to sit in discomfort and to also celebrate in the light. And that was something that was missing in my life. I was the, like you said, I was the top everything, check, 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 check. I'm going to achieve this. That will help me be happy. That will help me feel fulfilled. But actually like I wasn't celebrating my, um, achievements. I was waiting for the next thing to come along to complete me coming back to the, the codependent. We know not only can we create codependent relationships with loved ones, but we can also create them with, um, things in our environment and ideologies and constructs and, you know, businesses and fam like families. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a journey of, um, radical acceptance and allowing what is. Yeah. And learning to be with, with it all. I think so beautifully said, some people can't even like sit and celebrate when good things do happen. Like it's amazing, you know? So I, uh, I appreciate the insight that you're offering here because, you know, I'm, I don't know, we, we all learn from one another 
And I think that's, you know, that's part of the beauty. We're all connected. We're all here going through the same things. We're trying to have the same realization. We really, and we're just doing the best we can with what we have. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, um, I also realized I didn't answer one of your questions, which are what are the tools that I use to, to be, yeah, and then share that with us and then let us know how people can find you online. Yeah, absolutely. So to find me online, Instagram is probably best. It's just Danielle Matthews with an underscore on either end. And all my links are in the bio to connect in with stuff. Um, but for me, I use breath all the time. Um, when I find my mind super chatty, I'll just breathe in through my nose for three and out through my mouth for five. And the exhalation being longer is super key. Um, but it just brings me right back in and it, you know, balances my system. I also make sure I'm out in nature all the time because nature to me is this balanced space. And when I get there and are energetically, it also balances me. And it allows like when you're just in the quiet, to me, it balances, you know, your well, and my the philosophy I learned, it's like the chitta, it it balances this, this, this energy within you that is you. Um, And I use yoga nidra, it's a guided meditation. And um, I do I do that during the day, if I need a nap, I'll just do yoga nidra. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's powerful. And it takes you deep. And um, yeah, and, and reset some some wonderful things. So those are all the the Do modalities. Do you have a favorite um, practitioner you follow? Because I, I I follow someone on YouTube. I can't remember her name for Yoga Nidra. Do you have some of the? Yeah. You- well, I I'm a facilitator of it on my website. I have oh, uh, nice. Yoga Nidra. So if people want to explore it, they can go there. It's brainbodyself.com. It's under the self tab. Um, but I study the Amrit method, A M R I T. And my favorites out on YouTube, uh, John Bossler. I love his. Okay. Uh, he was one of my teachers. Very cool. Very cool. Well, that's amazing. And I know we're like recording this before the holidays, but this is airing right in the middle of the holidays and the hustle bustle. And I can't think of any better practice to just come back to present when all of the, all of the stressors in our environment are clamoring for, you know, like that it, Christmas to me is such duality (laughs) because, um, as a mom, there's a lot to do and there's a lot, you know, there's all these things that come up with busyness, but then there's also so much to celebrate. So it's kind of that, that beautiful time to just kind of put this into practice. And I, I think yoga nidra is, is really powerful for that. And then like you're saying with nature, it really is a natural calibrator of a recalibrator, I guess I could say of, of our internal state, just being in that earthing place, connecting to the elements. So thank you. This was really enlightening. Um, and for our listeners who, um, do you have uh, a a program or a, a place that people can go to initially just to find the meat of your work? You mentioned Instagram, not all my followers are on Instagram, but what was the name of your website again? My website is brainbodyself.com and I'm on all the platforms like Facebook, TikTok, like you can find me, reach out. I love to, and um, would love to, you know, help anyone on the next step of their path that I can. Beautiful. Thanks so much for this discussion, Danielle. This was really enlightening for me. Sure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening. And you know, there's so many lessons to be learned amidst adversity, like really painful, almost like a shock state where you're just in this suspended state of complete uncertainty, like your whole world exploding, that level of a line in the sand really from the universe and sort of this nudge from your soul to take a grand time out. That's actually what I'm intending to do in some respects. I mean, I haven't had a huge traumatic life thing happen, but I do have some things in the work and actually the universe is just like ramping it up for me to witness and see that I need to take a time out for a bit. So there's going to be more to follow on that in my next episode, 222, as I referenced in the intro. 222 is a magical number for me. It's a pattern that comes up a lot. I look at the clock and it's like 222 and I've just had a lot of red thread divine timing things happen around those three numbers and they are master numbers. So anyway, the next episode, um, I'm going to go into uh, what's next for me and what you can expect from this podcast and some of my offerings and messaging moving forward, especially as I hunker down to finish up my memoir. Have a lovely couple of weeks and we'll talk to you next time on Stand, Speak, Shine.